tonight on CBC Vancouver News. Pack up the rest of my stuff and uh, I'm out of here. Deadline day. People living in tents in a Vancouver park are forced to leave, but will they also? A BC father on trial denies killing his daughters. Andrew Barry says the family was attacked and... It's pathetic what's going on. Something's got to be done. The call to allow seal and sea lion hunting in BC and why the DFO isn't on board. This is CBC Vancouver News. Good evening. A BC father on trial for the murder of his two daughters is denying he killed them back on Christmas Day nearly two years ago. The CBC's Estefania Duran is at BC Supreme Court, where today Andrew Barry testified for the first time in his own defense. Not responsible for the deaths of six-year-old Chloe and four-year-old Aubrey. That's the stance Andrew Barry has taken at his second-degree murder trial. He's also denying he tried to kill himself. Instead, Barry says he was brutally attacked in his apartment in Oak Bay that Christmas day in 2017. And when he regained consciousness, he found his daughters had been stabbed to death. The defense is blaming a gambling addiction, which it states dates back to the 90s. Barry owed more than $25,000 in gambling debts to loan sharks. And as part of an arrangement to pay back that money, court heard Barry had agreed to keep a package in his apartment and had given his spare keys to men associated with the loan shark. And speaking about the relationship Barry had with his daughters, he teared up and told the jury he would play with them all the time and go camping together. Barry testified he and his daughters played in the snow for hours that Christmas morning. And when they came back to the apartment in the afternoon, he was attacked in the bathroom. The proceedings have been tense at times, interrupted by frequent objections. And the defense has suggested that Crown witnesses have manipulated the evidence for the jury's benefit. Today marked the first day of the defense's case, almost four months after the trial started. Estefania Duran, CBC News, Vancouver. Well, just a few minutes ago, the deadline to pack up and leave passed for people illegally camping in Vancouver's Oppenheimer Park. An eviction order was issued on Monday for tonight. Mike Colleen was there all day, but as he reports, not all the tents are gone. So you've got a space? They've got a space for you? Yes. How long have you been here? I'm here. A um, couple months. Boomerang, as he's called here, is on the move. You must be happy that you're leaving. Um, yeah, I guess so. I think, personally, I got my own place. I'm happy about that. He's packing up, leaving Oppenheimer Park for a single-room unit in this hotel in East Vancouver. The city says Boomerang is one of about 75 people here who've accepted offers to move into safe and stable accommodation. Robbie Thomas has also found a place to go. It feels good. I've been out here for like a uh, year and a half. And I love it, <laughs> but I uh, have a lot of memories now off to the new apartment. But with the eviction deadline passed, dozens of people are still camping illegally in the park, some refusing to leave, others waiting for help finding a place to live. BC Housing admits it won't be able to find a permanent home for everyone here. For those who've maybe recently arrived or who have just shown up on site today or yesterday, um, we can't make any kind of a commitment at this point as to the amount of housing stock that would still be available for them. Some housing advocates say there have been unintended consequences resulting from the strategy of finding and renovating units specifically for Oppenheimer Park tenters. These 100 units have been stockpiled over months, meaning that people outside of the park who could have been housed for months, who are homeless, could have been housed for months, have not been because they've been held and stockpiled for this time so that the city could then do this big show of having 100 units and housing a whole bunch of people all at once. Those optics for campers like Robbie Thomas don't matter. Time to leave though? Yeah, pack up the rest of my stuff and uh, I'm out of here. As I mentioned, Mike Lean has been there all day, and we will have more from him at Oppenheimer Park later in the show. He's going to be looking at the perception that the area has reached a tipping point. 
A man has been charged in the death of a 19-year-old woman in Delta last summer. Police arrested 44-year-old Chow Chen last Friday for impaired driving causing death. The crash happened on June 2nd of last year and killed Olivia Malcolm. Malcolm and her friend had pulled over on the side of the road and got out to look for something in the truck. Now, while searching, they were allegedly hit by Chen's Jeep. Malcolm was killed by the impact and her friend suffered non-life-threatening injuries. Chen has been released on a number of conditions, including not operating a vehicle or being intoxicated in public. He will appear in court near the end of September. Southwest Marine Drive was closed for much of the day after a car slammed into a pole during this morning's commute. Only one vehicle, a silver Honda, was involved in the crash. The driver was taken to hospital with serious injuries. Southwest Marine Drive is closed between Baklava and Blenheim uh, while police investigate the cause of the crash. It's expected to reopen this evening. In the meantime, police say transit buses are being allowed through, but drivers should avoid the area. And a stretch of 12th Avenue reopened this afternoon ahead of schedule after being closed to traffic for weeks while crews replaced a water main. Construction began back in July and shut down four blocks of the busy commuter corridor between Kingsway and Fraser. The city said the water main was in critical condition and a number of leaks earlier this year forced the replacement earlier than planned. The city's goal was for the work to be finished by Labor Day long weekend, but instead the road reopened this afternoon. The new water main is expected to last 100 years. Seven of the workers arrested at Vancouver's Hastings race course faced hearings today to decide if they can stay in Canada. The men were arrested during a surprise raid at the racetrack early on Monday. Horse owners say they are foreign workers who helped groom and care for the horses. Counsel for one of the workers said in the hearing his client had obtained what he thought was a real registration card that allowed him to work. People were under the impression that they were working with the license and they had license to work at the, at the racetrack and uh, someone provided that license to them. They pay for the license and they were under the impression that they were following all the, all the rules. Authorities believe the registration cards were copied and altered by an employee of the Gaming Policy Enforcement Branch. That person is currently under investigation. A Vancouver masseur has been criminally charged after a woman claimed she was sexually assaulted in her downtown home last week. Police believe the masseur uses an app to find and book clients. CBC Vancouver News at 11 host Dan Burrett joins us live now with more. Dan, what allegedly happened between these two? Anita, police say the woman contacted them after she hired a masseur for a treatment at her home on August 14th. The BPD says they believe the accused, 33-year-old Alexander Varfolomiev, was self-employed and used an app called Soothe to book clients, then go to their homes to provide that treatment. Now police say he has been charged with sexual assault and the company behind Soothe has been cooperating with police. This, this individual is no longer, no longer going to be working with uh, that app or vice versa. The, the app is no longer going to use this person uh, as, a, as a massage uh, therapist. Varfolomiev has been released on a number of conditions. He can't provide any massage services or physical therapy to anyone. This afternoon, BC's College of Massage Therapists told CBC News Varfolomiev was not registered with it. Anita? Dan Burrett, live for us tonight. Thank you. An urgent call tonight on the federal government to open up the commercial seal hunt. A group of First Nation leaders says the marine mammals are having a big impact on coastal salmon stocks. But as John Hernandez reports, some scientists say a seal harvest could do more harm than good. It's pathetic what's going on. So something's got to be done. Haida elder Roy Jones Jr. is on a mission dressed in seal hide, he's sending a message to Fisheries and Oceans Canada. If we don't start managing the seal and sea line, we're in serious trouble. We cannot continue with the road department of Fisheries and Oceans is on. They haven't managed, period. These documents, signed by Indigenous leaders and fishing companies, are urging the DFO to open up the commercial seal and sea lion hunt. It's been closed for about 40 years along the B.C. coast. Proponents say the marine mammals are feasting on struggling salmon stocks. We feel that we could create roughly about 4,000 jobs in our coastal communities. 
in the BC coast. And the long-term benefit is our children, our grandchildren, and great-grandchildren will hopefully be having salmon on their dinner plates. Studies suggest there are about 100,000 seals and sea lions along the BC coast. The Pacific Balanced Pinniped Society says the animals have become pests to commercial fishermen. Members argue the marine mammals could be harvested sustainably with their hides and meat sold overseas to markets in Asia. But not everyone in the scientific community is on board. My biggest concern is what's going to happen to the rest of the ecosystem. Marine researcher Andrew Trites says there could be unintended consequences. Mainly transient killer whales rely heavily on seals for food. Half of their food will have been removed. And for what purpose? So some people can make money, so some people can uh, sell it to as meat to China or high-end restaurants in San Francisco. There are more transient killer whales in the Salish Sea than there have been in decades. That's the big reason why the DFO is hesitating to open the seal fishery but officials say they are reviewing proposals for a commercial hunt. For now, Indigenous communities are allowed to hunt them for food and ceremonies. John Hernandez, CBC News, Vancouver. Construction of the Trans Mountain Pipeline expansion is getting underway again. Work will start right away at the West Ridge Marine Terminal in Burnaby. Meanwhile, the federally owned company is telling contractors to get ready to head back to work on sections of the pipeline in other areas. As the CBC's Rafi Buchikanian reports, Trans Mountain plans to have shovels in the ground starting next month. Ottawa says today is the day after multiple delays, Trans Mountain has issued directives to multiple companies such as SA Energy right here in Edmonton to start hiring. They've got 30 days to hire employees and then they'll begin the work on some segments of the Trans Mountain pipeline. Of course, it took a long time to get here. The project has been delayed by court decisions. Ottawa bought the Trans Mountain pipeline for 4.5 billion dollars and the opposition points out that today's announcement is coming right before a federal election now here's what natural resources minister amarjeet sohi had to say about that it is unfortunate uh, that uh, that some politicians do try to politicize uh, these decisions we took the necessary time and we did the hard work to get to the to the conclusion and we made the decision uh, to approve this project the companies themselves are eager to get to work we've been committed to this project for the last three and a half years we are vested you can see we have equipment parked here ready to go we have people who are anxious to go to work um, we're we are all in to get this project built Trans Mountain says it's received the majority of the permits it needs to complete the pipeline. Ottawa expects Trans Mountain to be up and running by mid-2022. That's despite the fact that there are still six Indigenous groups that have gone to court again in B.C. over the controversial project. Rafi Bujikanian, CBC News, Edmonton. Now, Kinder Morgan Canada is being sold just one year after the federal government bought the Trans Mountain Pipeline from the company. Calgary-based Pembina Pipeline Corporation has signed a deal to buy Kinder Morgan Canada that includes both the Canadian and U.S. portions of the Cochin Pipeline. The $4.35 billion deal also includes Vancouver Wharves, which is a bulk storage and export-import business. Today, Pembina's CEO was noncommittal when asked if that company would consider buying the Trans Mountain Pipeline. A Victoria man charged with abducting his four-year-old daughter and leaving her in Indonesia has been arrested. Brent Erskine was picked up at Victoria International Airport when he returned to Canada on Monday. Police allege on June 30th, Erskine took his daughter, Samantha, to Vancouver as part of a vacation agreement with the child's mother. And the two are no longer together. When the child wasn't returned to her mother, a week later, she got worried and contacted police. They say Erskine took Samantha to Jakarta, Indonesia, where he dropped her off with her maternal grandparents. Now, police are working to bring Samantha home. Well, Vancouver's Michelle Liu is set to make history at the Canadian Women's Open. She's just 12 years old, and she's going to be the youngest golfer ever to play in the championship. And to put her accomplishment into perspective, Liu is just heading into grade 8. She was born in 2006. 
Arthi Pohl explains how she came so far, so fast. Nice swing. The form, Perfect. the drive, the focus. It's all part of the winning recipe that makes Vancouver native Michelle Yu no ordinary eighth grader. Lined up on the range with people who in some cases are twice her age. On Thursday, Liu makes her debut at Canada's most prestigious golf tournament for women, held in Aurora, Ontario. I'm definitely very excited. Um, a little bit nervous too. It's definitely a highlight, I'd say, in my golfing career. A short career so far, but an impressive one. Already she's won two Junior World Championships. It all started at age six. The putting prodigy went to a golf camp with her older sister, but she wasn't thinking this far ahead. I mean, at six, I don't really remember it like that much, but I'd say that um, I definitely thought it was very interesting because it, there was a ball, there was a club. By age seven, Michelle was swinging like a pro. Her coach has been training aspiring golf pros for 28 years. In all of those 28 years, have you brought a 12-year-old to a professional tournament? No. <laughs> this is a first. He's so been training Michelle for six chance. years. More. Move your foot back more. There's something special about Michelle. Uh, she's very strong-willed. If she has a bad shot, she can leave it alone and move on to the next shot. One of the players Michelle has been following closely, defending champ Brooke Henderson. She qualified for the Canadian Open when she was just 14 back in 2012. I think I feel a little bit nervous. Meanwhile, Michelle's mom is all nerves and excitement. She says for Thursday's first round, Michelle will have an international audience. Her grandma will come from China and her dad will come and her best friend. And while they remain focused on Michelle, the extraordinary 12-year-old will keep her eye on the ball. Arthi Pohl, CBC News, Aurora, Ontario. Brett, you were just as good of a golfer at 12 years old, right? <laughs> I wish I could have been that good. I am seriously impressed by her abilities right there. No kidding. <laughs> Yes, now it was definitely a bit of a wet day. I know yesterday I've been calling for showers, and I think a lot of you maybe got rain instead. There's a subtle difference there. It did come down fairly heavy at times this morning, and that really had a huge impact on our temperatures. I wanted to show you what we're currently looking at right now all across the lower mainland. Notably, right now, Vancouver Airport, 19 degrees. This is the warmest that it has been all day, most of the day hovering right around 15 or 16. And I'll be honest, I'm a little grateful for my jacket right now standing outside here. The rain has stopped actually right now. We're just dealing with a little bit of cloud at the moment, though that rain was coming in bursts, especially later on into the afternoon for places like Abbotsford and into the Fraser Valley. The question is though, is that going to be continuing? Are we going to get any more rain? The answer is no, probably not. So there's going to be the risk for a slight shower coming up, but instead it is just a temperature story. Overnight, we are going to be going down to around 15 degrees, largely a little cooler towards Surrey, but then tomorrow those temperatures are going to be quite comfortable once again back into the low 20s and that sun will make a return too. All right, Brett, we'll talk to you soon. Thanks. You're welcome. Well, volunteer trail builders in the Fraser Valley say they're the subject of a crackdown from the province. As the CBC's Rafferty Baker reports, the trail builders claim enforcement officers are visiting and calling them with orders to cease and desist on Crown land. Getting down to the good stuff. This, this brown, beautiful. Graham Hulker and Sam Waddington smooth out a lumpy section of trail in Chilliwack. It's used by both hikers and mountain bikers. The spot they're improving is near the edge of Crown Land. They've been ordered not to do any maintenance farther up the trail. I heard from one of our directors of the Chilliwack Park Society that we'd, they got a phone call to cease and desist. Waddington says he's also been ordered to quit doing maintenance on another trail, that one on Crown Land near Cultus Lake. I actually had a visit from a compliance and enforcement officer myself um, for uh, trail building and maintenance that I've been doing. So uh, cameras were set up in the forest to, I guess, catch some of us who are out there. Waddington says signs have appeared on some trails warning people that they need authorization to do any construction, rehabilitation or maintenance on Crown land. I think that one of the big tragedies happening here is you're making volunteers feel like criminals. And if that's the stage that we're at with our government, I think that that, that needs to shift. Waddington says a big part of the problem revolves around massive permitting delays. 
The extensive Vetter Mountain Trail network nearby recently received approval, about 15 years after applications were submitted. The provincial ministry behind trail approval and enforcement declined an interview request. A spokesperson with the Ministry of Forests, Lands, Natural Resources and Rural Development sent a written statement. It says the Chilliwack Recreation District receives more trail applications than can be reviewed by staff. And for less complex approval requests, applicants can expect the process to take about one year to determine if a new trail is authorized. Just leave us alone to do what we want to do. We do it within boundaries. We don't do anything just willy-nilly. We don't, don't just rush at things. We think things through. Hulker says he's just building the trails that the local community wants to use and that other levels of government have bought into. Rafferty Baker, CBC News, Chilliwack. Some pretty interesting stories tonight. So if you want to watch those stories or any of our award-winning content wherever you go, you can do so by downloading the free CBC Gem app. CBC Vancouver is also available on Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram. Make sure you follow us on all of those platforms and you'll get content that you won't see right here on TV. Donald Trump snubs Denmark after the country expresses no interest in selling Greenland. How the U.S. president is lashing out coming up. About one in five people in Canada with HIV don't even know they're infected. Researchers are hoping a new diagnostic tool can change that. And as Vicodopia reports, they're studying a self-testing kit, which could be on pharmacy shelves by next year. Instructions. HIV tests used to take weeks. Now it's just a minute. These three little vials and a drop of blood is all it takes for a clear diagnosis. This community clinic performs 9,000 HIV tests on people a year. The director says demand is as strong as ever, and getting these kits on pharmacy shelves and in people's hands could meet the need. A real option of a fast test. Um, but also a private test and something they can get outside the health authorities. Canada's HIV numbers aren't going down. There's a new diagnosis every four hours. It's an infection rate similar to the European Union's, but Canada is falling behind high-income countries like Germany, Sweden and Australia. And some Canadians are more vulnerable than others. Black and Indigenous people are less than 9% of our population, yet make up almost half of new HIV cases. Experts estimate as many as a quarter of people with HIV have not been tested for it. Stigma is part of the problem. That's why Mike Smith didn't get tested when he was growing up north of Toronto. For Smith, getting professional advice about sexual health was not an option. This doctor was just not open, was very um, judgmental, and I always felt nervous going to doctor's appointments, even if I had the flu. I mean, I would be Smith works to encourage men to get checked for their HIV status. Even with better access to testing in the healthcare system, barriers remain. People don't want to go to an overcrowded sexual health clinic to get tested. Um, people still fear uh, facing homophobia uh, from their doctor. Um, like these things can be addressed with a home self-testing kit. Inside your self-testing kit. You That's why the European Union approved the same take-home tests for sale three years ago. Health Canada wants clinical trial evidence from Canada before it does the same. The researcher heading that trial says Canada Perfect. is playing catch up, not just in approving the tests for sale, but in attitudes towards HIV self-testing. I mean, this is going on around the world, right? And, and we know it's working. I, I think, you know, we're, Canadians are very cautious, in some ways but perhaps a bit too paternalistic about this. We have to put confidence in, in people and give them choices. Giving people that choice could mean the difference between getting treatment and infecting others. Vicodopia, CBC News, Toronto. For more details on that story, you can visit us online, cbc.ca slash bc. Stay with us. We'll be back with the latest in international headlines in just a few moments.
An election is coming up, and as Trudeau makes the case for why he should be re-elected, there is still one frosty relationship continuing to test his government, China. Katie Simpson has more on Trudeau's message for Beijing. In a room filled with foreign policy buffs, Justin Trudeau delivered a speech sounding more like a candidate than prime minister. The Conservatives envision a world where Canada hectors from the sidelines. Attacking the opposition, praising NAFTA and his relationship with the U.S., he also acknowledged Canada's biggest challenge ahead. We must recognize that China is a growing power and increasingly assertive towards its place in the international order. Canada has been the target of Chinese backlash since the arrest of Huawei executive Meng Wanzhou in Vancouver on an American extradition request. In retaliation, Beijing detained Canadians Michael Kovrig and Michael Spaver and blocked some imports, including canola. We do not escalate, but we do not back down. All of this will come up tomorrow when U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo makes his first official visit to Ottawa. Well, we will continue to work with Canada where we can diplomatically to help secure the release of these unjustly detained individuals in China. Canada would like Pompeo to make an even stronger statement, though the U.S. may be asking for some public support of its own. The Trump administration has failed to negotiate a trade truce with China, despite tariffs and personal interventions by the president. I am the chosen one. Somebody had to do it. So I'm taking on China. And I think that's what the United States would, see, would like to see, is that Canada is, is on, their, on their side, staunchly supporting the United States' vision of moving China into a rules-based market order. This former diplomat says whatever comes out of the visit, he's not expecting Canada's tensions with China to ease anytime soon. They're slapping us around and they're getting away with it. And the only way we're going to be able to... It's, it's very hard for us to push back because we don't have that much that we can push back with. One way Canada and the U.S. can get China's attention is to weigh in on the protests in Hong Kong. Beijing has already told Foreign Affairs Minister Christa Freeland to mind her own business, a sign the pressure is working. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Ottawa. Thousands of protesters rallied at a transit station in suburban Hong Kong today. Angry, no one has been prosecuted over an attack on demonstrators in July. <laughs> Some at the rally clashed with police, spraying fire extinguishers and blocking exits. But the protests stopped short of the battles seen recently in Hong Kong. The demonstration marked one month since the mass assault at the Yinlong Station, when suspected triad gangsters attacked black-clad protesters, hurting 45 people. Well, Donald Trump is answering some awkward questions about why he's backed out of a visit to Denmark. As Paul Hunter tells us, it seems Trump was highly offended that his offer to buy Greenland was rejected so strongly. There it is, the place Donald Trump wants to buy and turn into America, the massive island of Greenland, even tweeting tongue-in-cheek that if it happened, he wouldn't do this. But when the Prime Minister of Denmark, whose kingdom includes Greenland, called Trump's idea to buy the place absurd, Trump's retort was to abruptly cancel an official visit to Denmark next month. Today, he emphasized it's because he flat out didn't like being labeled absurd. Denmark, I looked forward to going, but I thought that the Prime Minister's statement that it was absurd, that was a, it was an absurd idea, was nasty. I thought it was an inappropriate statement. All she had to do is say, no, we wouldn't be interested. Suddenly, in an out-of-the-blue international kerfuffle, the Prime Minister. It is with uh, regret and uh, surprise that I received the news that uh, President Trump has cancelled his state visit to Denmark. Other Danes were somewhat less circumspect. To me, it sounds like he cancelled because his feelings are hurt. So if he's that stupid, um, I think it's good that he's not coming. Without a doubt, Greenland, with its natural resources and big footprint in the ever more coveted Arctic, is suddenly prime real estate. But, say critics, including a former U.S. ambassador, it's not so much what Trump wanted, but how he reacted when rebuffed. The idea that you would make a state visit 
contingent on the concept of negotiating uh, the sale of part of their kingdom. Um, this is uh, offensive. Or maybe it's not about that at all. Others were quick to point out that Trump's trip to Denmark would have coincided with that of another prominent American, Barack Obama, and that maybe Trump was worried he'd have less love, smaller headlines, so he pulled out. Plausible these days in this country? Who knows? Paul Hunter, CBC News, Washington. Some say crime on the downtown east side is the worst it's ever been. But is that true? After the break, we're crunching the numbers. And well, it's not as black and white as you may think. Here are some of the stories we're following tonight on CBC Vancouver News. A BC father is denying he killed his two daughters on Christmas Day in Oak Bay nearly two years ago. Andrew Barry is on trial for second degree murder and on the stand today, 
He said his family was brutally attacked. He says he was knocked unconscious, and when he woke up, his daughters had been fatally stabbed. If we don't start managing the seal and sea line, we're in serious trouble. A First Nation group is pressuring the government to allow seal and sea lion hunting. They say controlling the population is critical to protecting salmon. But the Department of Fisheries and Oceans says it could be harmful to transient killer whale populations feeding on the mammals. I got my own place. I'm happy about that. But personally, I don't think people that some people don't want to move in the, you know, modular houses and stuff like that. The eviction deadline has passed and many of the people living in tents in Vancouver's Oppenheimer Park are now on the move. BC Housing says it has relocated 75 people to safe and stable housing, mainly single room occupancy units that have been renovated. Still, some campers have not found a place to go or are choosing to stay at Oppenheimer. And the CBC has been talking to people about the downtown east side for weeks now, with many saying the neighborhood is in its worst shape. But do the stats support the argument? CBC Municipal Affairs reporter Justin McElroy dug into the numbers and spoke to Mike earlier today. So, Justin, I think it's fair to say the perception certainly is that things have, have never been this bad, never been as worse here on Vancouver's downtown east side. You've, you've looked at the numbers, uh, uh, the data. What are, what's it telling you? And it's an interesting thing, Mike, because people are talking about this as we're at an inflection point. But when you compare numbers today to 2017, there hasn't been that much of a change. You look at homelessness in the city of Vancouver, up 4% since then. You look at crime statistics recorded by the VPD in Strathcona and the Central Business District district up six to eight percent and you look at overdose numbers they're down 24 percent in the city of Vancouver this year so we've been hearing a lot about how it's uh, dramatically gotten worse but at least from a statistical perspective we don't really have numbers showing that at this point no doubt the data is is difficult to measure what, what are some of the reasons for that well and part of it is it's just what people are seeing we're in the middle of a high profile camp that has been going on all summer and part of it frankly too when you talk to people it's about how well the number of crimes and the number of homeless people is around the same or just a slight increase the area that they're in has changed you know uh, 10 15 20 years ago we would consider the downtown east side a sprawling area from about Camby all the way into East Rathcona. Today, it's very much constricted to about five by two blocks. That means that it's much more visible, it's much more dense. That causes issues for people traveling. It also causes issues for people in the neighborhood who feel boxed in. Justin, thank you. Thanks, Mike. Okay, Mike has made his way back here, mm -hmm. but you were at Oppenheimer Park about, what is that, about 35 minutes ago yeah. when the eviction notice came, or deadline came down at six. Did anything actually happen? No, I mean, the deadline came and went. Uh, nothing really changed. Uh, police have been on standby around the park for the duration of uh, the situation, but uh, no, the question will be what happens next. So the deadline has, has passed. If people refuse to leave, uh, I suppose they could. Uh, the city could seek an injunction to try to have them forcibly removed. There's been no indication that that's going to happen at this point. They're still trying to work with people there to get them into uh, permanent, suitable housing. So we will see what happens in the next few days. Okay, so you've spent some time there over the last few days. What have you noticed? You've been talking to all the campers there. Yeah, I mean, on Monday when we were there doing this broadcast uh, live at 6, there it was wall-to-wall tents. But uh, take a look today. Uh, considerably uh, fewer tents. A lot of them had uh, had been removed. Uh, a lot of the people have, have packed up and, and gone. Uh, the city tells us that about 75 of the people who had been tenting uh, illegally there have been placed in safe and secure housing, mainly SRO units that have been uh, renovated. They've either been placed in those units or they are about to be, and we uh, talked to a, a couple of folks uh, Boomerang, that's uh, Robbie Thomas right there with the, the black hat on. He has been in the park for a year and a half and uh, is going to be moving just down the street to the Flint Hotel into a SRO unit there. So uh, still work to do. As you can see, there's still quite a few tents uh, in the park, and we'll be keeping an eye on it over the next few days. All right, watching closely. Thanks, right. Mike. You are looking at a live shot of downtown Vancouver tonight at 638. Plenty of rain today and cooler temperatures, but tomorrow the sun returns. Brett has the full forecast coming up.
In December, an arrest was made that put Canada into the middle of a trade war between the United States and China. Ms. Lang, what do you have to say to the charges? I'm Stephen Quinn, the host of a new CBC Vancouver original podcast. This is Sanctioned, the arrest of a telecom giant. It's the complicated story of how and why Huawei CFO Meng Wanzhou was arrested. Download Sanctioned today at cbc.ca slash sanctioned or wherever you get your podcasts. All right, this is a story we've all been talking about and fantasizing oh, about yeah. today in the newsroom. <laughs> a Richmond man says he plans to live like a king. Why? Because he has now won the biggest lotto prize in BC history. Yes, Joseph Catalinic matched all seven numbers in July 26th Lotto Max jackpot draw, winning a whopping $60 million. Wouldn't that be nice? The retired commercial fisherman says he went to three different stores to make sure that his ticket was, in fact, the winner. But he waited nearly a month before he cashed in his prize. Have you done anything to celebrate so far? I had a shot of whiskey and that was it. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I needed it. Yeah. Catalinic has been retired for 20 years. He says he plans to take some family trips to Hawaii and visit the town in Europe where his parents were born. I hope the whiskey was at least yeah. a really expensive, <laughs> like a nice, nice vintage one. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but I'm going to ask you here: What do you think the odds are of trying to win that oh, jackpot? Gosh. Could you even guess? I, I don't even want to try to guess. Yeah. One in 33 million. Wow. Yeah. That's how unlikely it is to match seven numbers. Well, that's lucky Joseph. Yes. I'm sure he's going to have a great uh, next you know, 10 years, yeah, 20 years. I think so. And uh, I mean, if you didn't really like the rain, you might not have considered yourself lucky this morning. But I think, as I mentioned, the region did need it. And I think, first of all, there really wasn't much of a sunrise to go on here. Instead, it was just cloudy, and then it looked a little bit foggy. And then, bam, right around 9 o'clock, as many people can probably attest, the rain came in in full force. And honestly, that kind of looks like a car wash, I'll be honest. Uh, but that definitely was the story for much of the day. And then we did end up clearing up rather nicely. So what does the next 24 hours have in store? Well, I did want to mention that as we go through for the evening hours here, there's still the slight risk for an isolated shower for the next couple of hours, maybe down toward Delta and Surrey. But as we go through the overnight period, much of those showers are going to be falling more so over the North Shore Mountains. But tomorrow morning, I want to give you a full heads up, it is going to be cloudy. It is likely going to be drizzly, and you may think that it's going to rain, but it won't. At least I hope it doesn't, because instead the day is going to be clearing up quite nicely. By the time we get into the afternoon, hours, we're going to be seeing that sun make a return and those temperatures are going to be a lot warmer. However, I do have my eye on the next system that is making its way over the Pacific and headed off to the BC coast yet again. This one targeting once more the North Shore, sorry, the North Coast rather, including Haida Gwaii. And by the way, Prince Rupert racked up 94 millimeters of rain since Monday and more is on the way for them. Of course, you're going to be wondering, is this going to affect us down here in the south? It looks like we may have just a little blip on our radar here for Saturday, but otherwise, it's actually going to be quite nice. Temperatures, as I mentioned, returning to seasonal well across the region, both for Friday and then actually for Saturday as well. It's going to be a fairly similar story. What does that translate to for your five-day forecast here in Vancouver? Well, as I mentioned, got that drizzle first thing in the morning. Temperatures, though, expecting to get up to about 21 tomorrow. And then for Friday, Saturday, Sunday, into the weekend mode, we're going to be looking more so at sun and cloud. Temperatures right around that 22 degree mark. So at this point in time, I wouldn't worry about having any of that rain come by on Saturday. It looks to be, you know, not a high confidence thing. But other than that, next week, I've got some high confidence in the fact it's going to be nice and sunny and even warm. Awesome. I think you'll like that, eh? I will like that. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much, Brett. Okay, him, her, he, she, them, they... Pronouns like these add convenience to our daily language. Mm -hmm. But for many people, binary male-female pronouns are just too limiting. 15-year-old Micah Cunningham gives us their perspective on the matter. Hi, my name is Micah, I am 15, and I'm here to answer some questions about being non-binary. So for me, being non-binary is really just like figuring out what identity fits fit me best. I realized that I wasn't really a guy or a girl. I didn't fit the gender binary. Uh, and being this way just feels better to me. I use uh, gender neutral pronouns, they and them, and I use gender neutral language to describe myself. So the most commonly used gender neutral pronouns are they and them. They are gender neutral, which means they don't really have either male or female labels attached to them. 
They and them have actually been used as singular pronouns since uh, around the 14th century. You probably use it as a singular pronoun all the time without recognizing it. Like, if there's someone across the parking lot, you can just say like, hey, I think they double parked. There are some pretty funny alternatives, like babies and gentle thems, which I quite like. Uh, but you can also just say everyone or folks or y'all. A really nice alternative actually that I heard was date mate instead of boyfriend or girlfriend. When I first came out, yeah, my brother uh, immediately started calling me his sibling. Figuring out that I was non-binary is one of the hardest things for me, at least to put into words. I do remember just thinking that there is something wrong with me, that I am the weird kid for wanting to hang out with like only the guys or only the girls when they shouldn't be. Uh, but it's, it's different now. It's correct in a way that is weird and new. And I can find other people who feel what I'm feeling and I can talk to them and I can make friends. For me, finding uh, this particular label has been pretty amazing. The SNC-Lavalin scandal broke in February, but opposition MPs are still hungry for more details. After the break, the push to hear from the Ethics Commissioner. Amy Bell, and here's what's in your CBC Vancouver inbox. If you've ever wondered what it's like behind the scenes here at CBC Vancouver, here's your chance. Go online and book a date to come in for a tour of our integrated newsroom. And our home can be your home. From concerts to galas to bar mitzvahs, our studio space can be transformed for any occasion and is available for rent. For more from CBC Vancouver, check us out online at cbc.ca slash bc. Three people have been killed in a fiery 10-vehicle crash, and it was so intense it prompted the evacuation of a small hamlet in southern Alberta. Oh my goodness. The crash involved three tractor trailers and seven passenger vehicles. One of the trucks was hauling fuel. The fuel ignited, causing several vehicles to catch fire. A second semi was hauling butane. The flames were so powerful, the hamlet of Chinook was evacuated for several hours. 
10 people are in hospital with injuries, two in critical condition. New developments in the SNC-Lavalin controversy today. Liberal MPs defeated a motion calling for the ethics commissioner to testify. Opposition MPs wanted the commissioner to address recent findings that the prime minister violated conflict of interest rules in the controversy. Salima Shivji has the latest from Ottawa. Hours before the meeting, the leader of the Conservatives was trying to shame Liberal members of the Ethics Committee. Six Liberal MPs. Frank Bayless, Mona Fortier. Saying they should vote for the Tory motion to hear from the Ethics Commissioner. Inside the committee room, demands for answers. So given that this was not about jobs, the most important question I want to ask is what motivated this? We need to know how extent was the interference and the obstruction. All while Mario Dion waited on standby to testify about why he ruled Justin Trudeau broke the law and answer opposition questions about why the clerk of the Privy Council office kept some evidence off limits from Dion, citing cabinet confidentiality. Either we have the rule of law in this country or we don't. I don't think this is a partisan issue. I think it's systemic. I think it's shocking that the senior civil service of this country could be manipulated by a transnational corporation in this fashion. But those arguments didn't sway most Liberal members who flex their muscle and use their majority. Mr. McKinnon. No. Madam Fortier. No. The motion is defeated. The one holdout, Nathaniel Erskine-Smith, but for an unexpected reason. I think the Ethics Commissioner's conclusions are actually legally flawed in many respects, and I'd like to ask him some questions about his legal mistakes. Afterwards, anger and accusations, but not much surprise. They joined the Prime Minister in attempting this cover-up. They are complicit. What the Prime Minister did is a resignation offence. It's a question for him to decide if he should resign. What were the Liberals so frightened of? While the Liberals had some accusations of their own. This is a partisan game. So I think we all know uh, that on the eve of an election, uh, this kind of partisan, partisan gamesmanship uh, by the opposition is, is uh, what it exactly appears to be. And that's where the Liberals want this to end, hoping that voters aren't tuned in and that minds were made up on this issue months ago. Buoyed surely by the latest polls showing the damning ethics report not making much of a dent, with the Liberals and the Tories neck and neck and the election around the corner. Salima Shivji, CBC News, Ottawa. This has been a record year for wildfires in Brazil. Now the president of the country is suggesting that NGOs could be to blame, and he claims they want to bring shame on his government because of funding cuts. As of Tuesday, Brazil has recorded more than 74,000 wildfires, mostly in the Amazon basin. That's an 84% jump from the same period last year. Video taken Saturday shows smoke filling the sky as fire burns near the airport in Porto Velo. The Amazon is home to the world's largest tropical forest. President Jair Bolsonaro is at odds with environmental groups over his vow to develop the region. For years, he's been treating his patients from inside his mobile hospital. But after three decades, he's ready to move on. Meet the roving island dentist after the break.
They're the most studied and famous whale family in the world. What's pushing J-Pod to the brink? I'm Gloria Makarenko, host of the new CBC British Columbia original podcast, Killers. Is it too late to save them? Well, this next video that we're about to show you might just be the definition of too close for comfort. We have three young grizzlies in our yard right now. Oh my gosh, and they're, they went into the, uh, into the root cellar. Two of them are in the root cellar right Oh my gosh, this video was taken in White Court, about 180 kilometers north of Edmonton. The trio of bears had been spotted in yards, breaking into root cellars, even peering into windows. Some good news for people wanting more to be done. The bears have been trapped and are going to be relocated. Yeah, that would just be terrifying. Yeah, <laughs> especially standing up like that. Yeah, exactly. Rough. <laughs> okay, after 30 years of treating patients in a converted school bus, Hornby and Denman Island's roving dentist is selling his practice. Well, Dr. Peter Walford had owned a number of practices on Vancouver Island, but when he realized that two islands southeast of Courtney weren't being serviced, he knew he had to step in with a mobile clinic. Now 30 years and two school buses later, it's time to move on. He's ready to sell his practice and it's 800 active patients to a dentist looking for something to be a little different. <laughs> and as for the patients, well, Walford says that he's enjoyed all the relationships that he's made over the years. 800 patients, yeah. wow. I can't imagine, I mean, Fun fact, I still actually go see my dentist that is in a completely different province. I've been with him my entire life, so I know there's that sort of so relationship that you build. you've moved to BC now. Yes. Do you need to start seeing my dentist? Yeah, do you have I, a referral? Would I be able I to? I do. Actually, there's a dentist that multiple people at CBC, I don't see him, but really? a bunch of other people see him. So I'm okay. sure you'll get lots of recommendations. Yes, that's exactly what I was hoping <laughs> for. Thank you. <laughs> okay, we are going to leave you with some beautiful closing pictures of orcas in Victoria tonight. And Dan Burt will be here at 11. Have a good night.